potato, potato. Oh God, headbutt the bloody mic. Oh. <laughs> Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you, yes you, aka Mim, who sent me this lovely picture of a cooktopus. How brilliant is that? I absolutely love it. It's Phil Chambers' girlfriend, by the way. Check her out on Instagram and uh, Twitter. She's amazing. Really, really good. And yes, you get to choose what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week, we have none other to thank than Brandon Ferreira for their suggestion of video games that you need to play twice to understand. Now, this is the thing. Video games, much like their heroes only being as good as their weapons, are sometimes only as grand as their narrative. Now that's not always the case, as the likes of, I don't know, like Tetris and Mario don't exactly need grand plots. I mean, it's just like, that dun lizard gone stolen my princess, I better go rescue her. But sometimes, because of the fact that we're moving away from the high scores and more towards the cinematic, a lot more weight is placed on the narrative. And then these games came along, with complex, convoluted, and sometimes absolutely baffling plots disappearing up their own arse and losing us in the process. So yeah, many wasted nights were spent trying to piece things together. So think of these as the kind of Pepe Silvia of the gaming world. With this in mind, I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are seven video games that you need to play twice to understand. Number seven, The Quiet Man. Ooh. The Quiet Man. Where to begin with this one, eh? This is a title that held so much promise, yet only delivered about 10% of it. Placing the player in the shoes of a hearing-impaired character who had the ability to kick the spines out of anyone he meets could have made for a really brilliant experience, and also offer a healthy bit of video game representation for the deaf community. Yet thanks to some incredibly poor direction, this game actually generated more anger than it did understanding. Now for some reason, the game's narrative is intentionally absurd. Obscured. You'll have moments where the character opens a letter to find out what the hell's going on, only for the camera then to zoom behind them so you don't actually get to see what's on the paper. And because there's no audio and no subtitles, you have not got a single bloody clue as to what the hell you're meant to be doing. So incendiary was the backlash that the developers actually undid the narrative choice that they'd made and released a patch that put the audio and subtitles back into the game, turning what was a confusing game with at least a unique if poorly implemented feature into just a generic generic action title. Still, at least you could understand the plot in the next go around, right? Small consolations. Number 6. Pathologic. <sighs> Pathologic. My god, how the hell does one begin to describe this game? I've played this, and never in my entire- I, I, I'm gripping the seat tightly, I'm that stressed out just thinking about it. Never across my tenure. Have I ever experienced a game that I recommend that you should definitely try, but at the same time should definitely steer away from as much as pathologic? It is at once one of the most immersive, fourth wall breaking, terrifying, philosophical and bleak experiences that I've ever played, but it is also a raging trash fire of cruel difficulty spikes, arduous gameplay and ugly as sin aesthetics. To try and express what the actual fresh hell goes on in this game would take me an entire essay and then some, but in short, the story here makes little sense to begin with, following a plague that is spreading through a remote town and whose inhabitants are the sort of uncanny strange that means that they would fit right into a Tim Burton flick. Their dialogue is verbose and complex, characters lie to you constantly, and your daily tasks often seem to take you away from your ultimate goal of curing the plague. And that's to say nothing of the fact that the game has three playable characters, each with their own unique story, and the weirdest thing is, is that when you select one of them, the other two characters are placed into the game and go about their own narrative quest. Now that sounds fresh and exciting, right? except that they make terrible decisions that impact your gameplay for the worse. When you're playing them, you're presented with choices and it allows you to make better decisions that benefit everyone, but the computer, when they're playing as them, makes the worst possible choices, making your game an utter slog. I hate it. <laughs> 
But I also love the fact that they do it. It's so unique, but so mind-bendingly awful. And on top of all of this are multiple fourth wall shattering endings, which see you speak to not only the air quotes gods of this world, but also the developers of the game itself. And it becomes clear that Pathologic is a game that is going to require multiple playthroughs and a big headache induced sleep to properly digest. Seriously guys, my eggshell is wearing thin at the best of times. This game might push me over the edge. Good luck. Number five, Journey. Now, I know you might be looking at this entry and thinking to yourself, um, Jules, you albino lemon of a man, I've watched Rick and Morty, therefore I am very smart, and the plot of Journey is not that complex or deep. And you know what? Yeah, I, I guess you're kind of right there, friend. Bit cruel that you said I look like an albino lemon, but still, I'm not talking about the plot itself being the thing that you have to understand here, but more so the actual gameplay tone, because it's only once you complete the game and go back and relive the experience again do you finally understand what the hell this game is about. For example, when I first played through this title at launch, I remember the huge rush of emotions I felt as I raced across the landscape, floating, drifting, and utterly losing myself to the act of chasing that horizon. So much so that I, along with many other players, assumed that the little companions that dipped in and out of the adventure with us were computer-controlled NPCs, just, you know, going along for the ride. Therefore, it blew my mind when I found out that these were in fact other players. The game suddenly held new meaning, as now I realised that my pilgrimage was not one done alone, and that the game had actually implemented some of the most subtle multiplayer in video game history. Now, while subsequent playthroughs of this game do not change the narrative of this title, they change the emotional tone, as now you're the one pushing the other player on, helping them reach their journey, and as a result, it's a much more enriching experience as a whole. I love this game. Number 4. Dead Rising now, despite Dead Rising definitely being very liberal when it comes to comedy, let us not forget that at its core, this is a survival horror experience from the hordes of the undead that are trying to rip you apart and feast on your tasty brain matter to the fact that there is actually an overarching real enemy being that bloody clock. Seriously, time, give me a goddamn break it can make for some very, very stressful situations indeed. It's very likely, in fact, that your first time within Willamette might actually end on a rather dour note upon your first stab at the game, as trying to complete every story mission and rescue all the survivors when Frank is ill-equipped and rocking stats that are absolutely pathetic makes for a truly arduous task. Therefore, you'll probably be met by one of the many endings of the first game in which Frank either comes close but just misses out on the true ending, or was simply left adrift in the Sea of the Undead. Who was behind the outbreak? Who are these characters? Why are they acting so mysterious? You shall never know, my friend. That is, unless you level up and take on the game fully strong. With a K. Luckily, the game allows for your skills to carry on in the next playthroughs, meaning that it's easier and easier each time you cycle through the events, until finally, when rocking a buff boy set of skills and a silly hat or two, you finally down the evil military commander at the end of the game and save the day. And it is worth all of that blood, sweat, and tears come the final resolution of this surprisingly affecting game. Number 3. Star Wars Shadows of the Empire Ooh, this one stings a little bit. Because you see, when I was a wee bold lad, I absolutely adored anything that had the Star Wars logo plastered over it. And thus, when Shadows of the Empire came out, I was absolutely chomping at the bit. I was like, give me some of that. Give me some of that right now. Give me some of that awful, awful combat mechanics and terrible camera controls. Ooh, yeah, and graphics that are so sharp you can cut beef on it. I love that game though, to be fair. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I was so head over heels with this game is because of the lovable rogue Dash Rendar. I wanted to see how his adventures would play out, but unfortunately it turns out that I'd made my first and most fatal mistake the moment that I actually started playing the game and selected medium difficulty, as it turns out that this locks you out of the actual ending of the title. Upon reaching the end of this baby experience, the game ends with a did Dash really die text pop up before telling you that in order to unlock the truth, you'd have to play on hard or Jedi mode. Now, to say that I was more than a little frustrated by this is probably a bit of an understatement. In fact, I'm pretty sure if I recollect, I can try and conjure up the noise that I made upon finding this out. Oh yes, it went something like this. You freaking bricks! But onward I slogged, against the jank, against the f***ing 
fucking difficulty spikes that these new difficulties introduced, all in order to understand the fate of Dash and his crew. Well, luckily, it turns out that they all survived. Huzzah! Hooray! Etc. Escaping in the Outrider and then choosing to let the world believe that they're dead in order to avoid gangs looking for revenge actually finding them. It may have taken a few weeks of smashing my head against this game and a fair few broken controllers, but at least I know now that Dirty Dick Dash and crew are safe and sound. Or at least until they were written out of the actual in-canon universe. And then added back in. And then taken back out again. I have no idea what, what is canon. What is canon in Star Wars now? I have no idea. Number two, Near Automata. Near Automata is a brilliant game, isn't it? It's over-the-top action and off-kilter comedy and mishmash of genre styles all make for an experience that only Platinum Games can deliver. It's fantastic. In fact, if I was to describe it in one word, you know what it would be. Noish. The constant change up to the formula, missions, and boss battles means that there is never a dull moment on offer here. However, on a first playthrough, you might be left with your head spinning so much that it actually bloody detaches. Now, the pace of this narrative is so rapid that some instances make sense only in the loosest of definitions. However, this is actually yet another brilliant move by the devs because these gaps are actually filled in in subsequent playthroughs with different characters. For example, a scene in which 2B might meet a boss and then just smash them to base elements, would see 9S be able to hack into said boss and be able to extract information about them, such as their backstories. This information builds on the larger narrative, connecting you to the story in deeper and deeper ways. Plus, when 9S is separated from 2B, you now get to experience his adventures, once more adding in details that are just glazed over or entirely absent from the first playthrough. And then to top all of this off, completing the game as 9S unlocks a brand new character and a new tale, and then uses all of the things that you've learned so far, not as an epilogue, but for a start of a brand new adventure. It just boggles the mind how much content is on offer here. In fact, it's so holy in its approach to delivering quality at every single corner that I believe that our friend Slimy J over here, Slime Jesus, probably had a fair few hands in it. Well, does he have hands? Do you have hands? No, you've just got wings, haven't you? What do you put in things then? Oh, I don't want to know. Oh, I do not want to know about that. But still, he has inspired today's musical interlude. Osley, are you ready, my friend? Well, considering you've locked Dows in the basement for, I don't know, like like a month or so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at least owe us like 10 million quid or something. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, really? Oh, cool. Well, in that case, I'll just order a takeaway and you can pay for it as well, yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wicked. Cheers, mate. Now, James, I've let you out of the cage today. You promised not to bite me like you did last time. Naughty boy. I have to use the shock collar again. Are you ready for a musical interlude, my friend? Yes, I am. Well, get your monk robes on, or in your case, I guess it would just be Jazz's little snuggly cover thing that she's got, actually, because that would work quite well, because we're going to be doing some gothic monk metal. This is the thing, guys. I know that they've, uh, they've shown this in a few previous episodes. But I give them absolute rubbish to work with, and these boys turn it around and Midas touch it. Gold. Golden boy. Golden. Anyway, it is a bonkers way of telling a story, but then again, Near Automata, potato potato, is a bonkers game through and through. And number one, Hades. So the explosion of love, adoration, and thirst for Hades is not unwarranted, seeing as it is another immaculate, immaculate, immaculate piece of gaming submitted to the world by Supergiant Games. Seriously, these guys absolutely knock it out of the park each and every time. Transistor, Bastion, the almighty pyre, and now Hades? Jesus Christ, leave, leave some goodness for the rest of the bloody devs out there. Yet, at the beginning of this game, the narrative is murky to say the least. Why are we trying to escape hell? Why are the gods of Olympus helping us? Who is our true birth mother and why isn't she here with us? Well, to answer all of these and to get one of the most satisfying endings in recent gaming memory, you better get to mastering your skills as you'll need to complete the game 10 times in order to get the 
true closure on this narrative. Now, the deal is that Zagreus is looking to escape Hell in order to find his true birth mother. Yet upon completing the title and defeating Hades, you learn that you can only exist in her realm for a short period of time. And so you agree that you will keep escaping Hell in order to spend time with her and learn more about why she left. With each run, you chip away at this mystery, and with each question you get to ask, you're spurned on to indulge more into that delicious gameplay loop again and again, until after 10 runs, 10 successful, arduous runs, you're finally rewarded with a moment of closure that is just... It's just brilliant. I don't want to spoil it, I know that we're probably going to have to show some footage of it, but I really do really do push each and every one of you to play this through and see this for yourselves because there's nothing like that sense of satisfaction from going through literal hell only to come out the other side and have things end in such a dramatic, heartfelt and wonderful way. I love this game. And there we go, my friends. Those were seven video games that you had to play twice to understand, or as in many of the cases here, multiple times in order to get closure on the narrative. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below, and put your suggestions for next week's episode down there as well, because I love to sift through all of them and take a look at all the crazy ideas, eat them up, and regurgitate them into one of these silly, silly lists. I love each and every one of you. And if you want to chat to me further, you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by live and Let's Dice. It's my gaming channel where I stream every single Wednesday and Sunday with my friends, and it would be great to see you over there, my dudes. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. I hope that you are well. I hope that you are treating yourself fairly, both mentally and physically, my friend, because you deserve love, happiness, and success. We all do as human beings out there, and do not let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise. And sometimes in life, We'll be going through situations that we don't understand. Sometimes we'll have to go through them multiple times in order to get ahead of the situation or to even be able to recognize where our energies are better spent or even when we need to ask for help. There is no shame in that. And remember, above all else, you are a massive ledge and you are not alone with your problems. You can share them and people will come to help you, I promise. All right? Treat yourself well. Big love from me to you. I'll see you next Tuesday, all right? Oh, dear. That was indeed a swear. Old school joke for the fans in the back. Peace out, everyone. Bye.